We talk a lot about ghosts on this podcast, supernatural activity, things outside of the tangible world, but we rarely ever dive deeper into what that means. Are we composed of energy never to be created or destroyed, but repurposed, flowing from one living body to another metaphysical mass? Or is there something outside of our physical body that doesn't decompose to be reutilized? I'm talking about the soul, or maybe a different word for it, an essence of who a person was. So many haunting stories are rooted in the idea of a soul, a restless person, emotional, perhaps vengeful or protective, that remains in the physical world, despite no longer having their physical body. But when it gets down to it, do we really believe in a soul? I'm assuming those listening are at least open to the idea of a soul, or something akin to it, or these ghost stories don't really seem to cut the mustard. So, like in so many of the spooky and strange stories that we've shared on this podcast, let's begin with a body. That body dies, but something from that body is left behind. Is the soul still connected? Okay, but what if a part of that physical body is still alive? That person had died, but something with their genetic code, their cells, remain living. Is their soul with their body or those cells? Maybe both? In this episode, we're going to explore a conundrum. A question of medical ethics, informed consent, one of wrong for the sake of the world, and ultimately, what about the human soul? I'm Nikki, and this is Tales of Two Cities. Hello? Welcome. This is Tales Two Cities. Hello, and welcome back. I first encountered Mrs. Henrietta Lacks just this year. I was teaching for a medical anthropology course with a professor who pushed students to remember the humanity of medicine, something that's so often lost to the science. We teased out the intricacies of many case studies. One in particular hit me hard. It was one that I hadn't ever heard of, the story of Henrietta Lacks. It both fascinated me and horrified me. There are so many aspects that are so relevant today in our constant battle of competent, affordable, and quality healthcare. One woman and billions of her cells have saved much of humanity from a birth of illnesses, though doctors couldn't save her. On August 1st, 1920, Loretta Pleasant was born in Roanoke, Virginia to Eliza and Johnny Pleasant in a small shack. Her name, at some point, was changed to Henrietta, and her family called her Henny. When she was just four years old, her mother died while giving birth to Henrietta's ninth sibling. Johnny, being overwhelmed, was unable to care for his ten children, so the family moved to Clover, Virginia, a small farming town. The children were distributed among their relatives, because no one person could take all 10 kids. Henrietta was placed with her grandfather, Tommy Lax. They lived in a two-story log cabin that was once slave quarters to a plantation. The plantation was owned by Henrietta's white great-grandfather and great-uncle. Tommy, like most of the family living in Clover, worked as a tobacco farmer. The children living with Tommy also did work. Henrietta shared a room with her nine-year-old cousin, David Lax. David, known to the family as Day, would one day become Henrietta's husband. By 1935, at 14 years old, Henrietta gave birth to her first child, Lawrence Lax, the son of Henrietta and Day. And four years later, in 1939, Elsie Lax, their first daughter, was born. Though, unlike Lawrence, Elsie was born with developmental disabilities. Her head hit the floor when she was being born, and the family thought that perhaps that's what caused her developmental issues. The family described her as different, and as was common in the time, quote, deaf and dumb. After years of sharing a room as cousins, and two children, 
Day and Henny were married on April 10, 1941, in Halifax County, Virginia. Later that year, a cousin, Fred Garrett, persuaded the two to leave the tobacco farm in Virginia and move to Maryland, where Day could work at Bethlehem Steel in Sparrows Point. The family didn't have enough money to move the kids, so Henrietta, Lawrence, and Elsie remained in Clover while Day moved to Maryland. But not long after Dave moved to Maryland, Garrett was called to fight in World War II. Garrett gifted his savings today to bring Henrietta and the children to a new home at 713 New Pittsburgh Avenue in Turner Station. Turner Station was one of the oldest and largest African-American communities in Baltimore County at the time. Once in Maryland, Henrietta birthed three more children, David Jr., Deborah, and Joseph who later changed his name to Sicario. Henrietta was a dedicated mother and wife. Elsie was her child and she loved her deeply, but she was convinced by family and friends that it was best for Elsie to move her to Crownsville Hospital Center, then known as the Hospital for the Negro Insane, believing that Elsie would be well taken care of. Joseph was born at Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore in November of 1950 just four and a half months before Henrietta was diagnosed with cervical cancer. Henrietta was an African-American woman in the United States during segregation. She had to travel to Johns Hopkins to be seen by a doctor and was seen in a separate part of the hospital. On January 29, 1951, Henrietta went to Johns Hopkins because she felt a, quote, knot in her womb. She had told her cousins about the knot before, but they assured her that the knot was likely because she was pregnant, and she was. But even after giving birth to her youngest and last child, Henrietta still felt the knot. She hemorrhaged during her delivery of Joseph. Her doctor then tested her for syphilis, but when the results were negative, he referred her to Johns Hopkins. In her book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, Rebecca Skloot explains that Henrietta wasn't comfortable going to doctors, and hospitals were foreign places. Despite having been to doctors before, who had suggested tests and procedures, Henrietta only did what she absolutely had to to maintain her health. She was a woman of color in a time where things were separate and not equal. She knew a lot about the farm she grew up on and how to harvest, to cook, but not much about medical terminology or how the human body worked. Going to the doctor was a last resort and often confusing. Soon, the pain was intense, but it was only after her knot began to bleed that she went to see Howard W. Jones. Jones, a gynecological surgeon, had joined Hopkins in 1948 with his wife, working on a part-time basis. Hopkins was one of the few hospitals that treated African Americans at the time. Upon examination, Jones noted, quote, an eroded hard mass about the size of a nickel. He explained that it was shiny and purple, delicate and bled at the slightest touch. He was shocked to see that despite having recently given birth and attending her follow-up appointments, there was no note of this mass in her medical record. He assumed that that meant the mass had grown quickly. Jones took a biopsy of Henrietta's knot, a cancerous tumor on her cervix. He told her it would be tested, and soon after, Henrietta was told that she had a malignant epidermoid carcinoma of the cervix. There are two important things to know next. First, Henrietta did not have an epidermoid carcinoma, but an adenocarcinoma. This wasn't correctly diagnosed until 1970, years after her passing. And it's important to know because there really wasn't a great scientific grasp of cervical cancer, or cancer at all, in 1951. And it leads us to our second important point. Henrietta's cells were taken to be tested, but those cells would also be shared. In the various appointments Henrietta would have following her first exam and subsequent treatments and surgeries, more of her cells would be taken, without her knowledge, and to be used in a laboratory, one that was committed to keeping human cells alive outside the body, something that hadn't yet been done 
The goal was to have cells that were viable outside the body to better understand disease, such as cancer, and to move toward better treatments and eradication. Henrietta was treated with radium tube inserts. Radium kills everything it comes in contact with, including cancer cells. Radium was a common treatment at hospitals at the time. It was an inpatient procedure, but she was discharged a few days later with instructions to return for a follow-up. During these treatments, cells were taken from Henrietta without her permission or knowledge. They took both healthy and cancerous tissue samples to be shared with another doctor, George Otto Guy. Guy was a Hopkins graduate and a trained biologist. He had an informal agreement with other doctors at Hopkins to have them share their cell samples taken from patients. Guy, Jones, and another doctor, Talind, were all invested in cancer research. They, as many doctors at the time and today, use cells following necessary testing as a means of payment for practicing in public wards. Patients had free treatment. Doctors could pursue their research. Guy and his wife were committed to fostering the first immortal human cancer cells. Guy even called himself the most famous human vulture. Both Talind and Jones agreed to share cervical cells with Guy. These samples would be taken to his pristine lab where lab technicians would clean them and prepare them for culture. Guy had developed a technique involving a roller drum as well as a culture medium that would help to nourish the cells that were no longer a part of a human body and therefore had no means of sustenance. One day, Henrietta's cells landed in Guy's lab and his lab technician, Mary Kubiak, sliced them into millimeter pieces, placed them in the medium, and stored them. She labeled them the sample, as she always did, using the first two letters of both the first and last name of the patient, H-E-L-A, HeLa, for Henrietta Lacks. Those cells were the first human cells to thrive. They didn't need a glass surface to grow, meaning they had no space limit. They continued to grow and grow. For Guy, it was like hitting the jackpot. He'd finally grown human cells outside the body, cells that were living and useful. When word got out that Guy had human cells, of course, many other doctors wanted a sample to use for their own experiments. Guy began sharing cells with colleagues. Some say that he charged $25 per sample. Others believe that he simply shared for the benefit of mankind. Either way, the cells became well known, and the Gila line was famous in science circles. Though Henrietta was not thriving as her cells were. On August 8, 1951, after radium treatments, Henrietta returned to Hopkins for her next treatment, though she was feeling worse each day. She complained of abdominal pain and was admitted to the hospital. She received blood transfusions and remained in the hospital for nearly two months. Her family knew that she wasn't long for this world. She was in constant pain, and despite the hospital's best efforts, nothing helped. She died on October 4, 1951, at just 31 years old. Her husband Day was convinced to allow an autopsy. The cancer that was once the knot in Henrietta's cervix had metastasized throughout her entire body. She was buried in an unmarked grave in the family cemetery, a place called Laxtown in Virginia. Laxtown was once Clover, when it was owned by white land and slave owners, members of the Lax family before the Civil War. But later generations gave the land to the many black members of the Lax's family, descendants of the African slaves and their white owners who once populated Clover. Henrietta was buried in Laxtown, but the exact location is unknown, even to her family. They believe she was buried within a few feet of her mother's grave the only one for decades that was marked with a tombstone. In 2010, Roland Patillo, 
a faculty member of the Morehouse School of Medicine, who worked with Guy and knew the Laxes, donated a headstone for Henrietta. The epitaph was written by her grandchildren and reads, Henrietta Lax, August 1st, 1920 to October 3rd, 1951. In loving memory of a phenomenal woman, wife, and mother who touched the lives of many, here lies Henrietta Lax, Gila. Her immortal cells will continue to help mankind forever. Eternal love and admiration from your family. Henrietta's body was not long for this world. Just 31 when she died of her metastasized cervical cancer. That cancer, those cells of hers, would go on to be immortal. Guy's cells, Henrietta's really, were a huge commodity for scientists studying anything from cloning to cancer, vaccines, and other diseases. Guy had observed the cells not only remaining alive, but reproducing at an astonishingly fast rate. Until Henrietta cells, human cells were never kept alive for more than a few days. It was simply impossible to complete the variety of tests on a single sample to maintain a semblance of a control. But Henrietta cells not only remained alive, but multiplied quickly. They were able to run multiple tests and be assured that there would be more cells to continue studying. Following her autopsy, Guy and his assistant, Mary Kubiak, used his roller tube technique to culture the new sample. Guy was able to start a line of cells, Henrietta cells, by isolating a single cell and repeatedly dividing it. What was once a sample of Henrietta became known to the scientific community as HeLa. HeLa cells were observed dividing multiple times without dying which was the first assertion of their immortality. The ability to utilize a single line of cells replicating experiments on the same cells allowed for an immensity of scientific breakthroughs. In 1954, just three years after Henrietta's death, Jonas Salk used HeLa cells to develop the polio vaccine. His new vaccine launched the first ever cell production factory, creating HeLa cells to test the vaccine. Chester Southam, a virologist, injected HeLa into cancer patients, prison inmates, and healthy control subjects in order to determine if cancer could be transmitted or vaccinated against. HeLa are the first ever human cells to be mailed. They were sent to scientists across the world to research cancer, AIDS, the effect of radiation, and other toxic substances, do gene mapping, and numerous other studies. In 1953, HeLa allowed for chromosomes to be seen for the first time. In 1954, they were the first cells cloned. HeLa was launched into space in a satellite by the Soviets in 1960 to study the effects of space on human cells. They've been used to study salmonella, HIV, tuberculosis, chemotherapy, and in vitro fertilization. Treatments for herpes, leukemia, influenza, hemophilia, Parkinson's, lactose digestion, sexually transmitted infections and diseases, and appendicitis have all come from the use of HeLa cells, as well as research on human longevity, mosquito mating, negative cellular effects, and effects of working in sewers. Truly, HeLa has become, as described by Sklut, the standard laboratory workhorse. Henrietta Cells, the HeLa line, has been reproduced enough to weigh 50 million metric tons. And remember, cells are so tiny that they can't be seen with the naked eye. Placed in a row, the cells would be 350 million feet, stretching around the world three times. Though immediately following her death and the consequential scientific discoveries, Henrietta was lost to the immensity of her immortal HeLa cell. Her humanity was dwarfed by the groundbreaking HeLa cell line. In the 1970s, it was revealed that a large portion of cell samples had been contaminated with HeLa. Scientists, in pursuit of purity and truth, began hassling the Lax family for blood samples for their research. With Lax blood, they could better differentiate between HeLa cells and other cell lines. In 
The family was told that they were being studied to ensure that they did not have the same cancer as their mother, but they were actually being used to better understand HeLa cells. The family, confused by the request, then discovered that the materials used for the majority of medical research were cells taken from their wife and mother. Ebony quoted Day as having not given permission for the autopsy, and Henrietta had never given permission to use her cells for medical testing. Her name was reported as Helen Lane, and her children began to ask questions about what happened to their mother and what was happening with her cells. Henrietta's youngest daughter, Deborah, believed her mother's spirit lived on in her cells. Quickly, the ethical concerns were the forefront of the miracle immortal line of cells. Henrietta and her family had never given permission to harvest cells, but at the time, permission was not required and never asked. Cells were legally allowed to be used in research and commercially without informed consent of the donor. And in the 1980s, the family's medical records were published without consent. It wasn't until 1990 that the Supreme Court of California decided precedent for the issue in the case of Moore versus Regents of the University of California. The court ruled that a person's discarded tissues and cells are not their property and can be tested on or commercialized. The landmark case stemmed from the cells of John Moore, taken in 1976 by Dr. David Gold, a cancer researcher at UCLA Medical Center. The treatment for Moore's hairy cell leukemia required samples of his blood, bone marrow, and other bodily fluids to be taken to confirm the diagnosis. Those cells were later developed into a cell line commercialized by Gold and UCLA. Moore had signed a consent form for the procedure. The document said the hospital could, quote, dispose of any severed tissue or member by cremation. Moore's blood profile returned to normal after a few days and led Gold to discover Moore had unique blood. His cells produced a protein that stimulated the growth of white blood cells, which protect the body from infection. Gold continued to see Moore despite Moore having moved to Seattle, Washington. After years of traveling back to Los Angeles for appointments with Gold, where samples of bone marrow, blood, and semen were taken, Moore asked to transfer to a doctor closer to home. Gold offered to cover his travel expenses, and Moore continued to go to LA for the appointments. Though, in 1983, Moore was sent a new consent form that said, quote, I do slash do not voluntarily grant the University of California all rights I or my heirs may have in any cell line or other potential product which might be developed from the blood and or bone marrow obtained from me. While Moore initially signed, he refused at subsequent appointments. He then discovered a patent on his cell line named Mo, which had been issued to UCLA Regents in 1984, with Gold and his research assistant listed as inventors. Gold held an agreement with the Genetics Institute that afforded him a position as a paid consultant and rights to 75,000 shares of common stock in the patent. Genetics Institute also agreed to pay Gold and Regents at least $330,000 over three years in exchange for exclusive access to the materials and research performed on the cell line and all products derived from it. Moore filed a lawsuit for his share in the potential profits from products or research conducted with his cells that had been done without his knowledge or consent. However, the court found that Moore had no property rights to his discarded cells or the profits made from them. The court found that his cells are, quote, no more unique to Moore than the number of vertebrae in the spine or the chemical formula for hemoglobin. When considering the notion that Moore's cells were his property, because property law is strict and complex, the court feared extending this to organs and cells would have an incredibly negative effect on medical research. The court found that the medical laboratories doing research received a large amount of samples and cannot be expected to know or discover if those samples were illegally procured. The court did find that Dr. Gold 
should have included his economic interest and potential economic gain in his informed consent process. Ultimately, the court found that the discarded blood and tissue samples are not a patient's personal property, and they do not have the rights to share in the profits earned by the commercial development of their cells. So Moore's case, years later, established that even now, cells can be taken and utilized for scientific testing without consent. However, the economic gain afforded to the scientists who have utilized HeLa is likely unknowable, but it is most certainly an astonishingly high figure. It's important to acknowledge that Henrietta was not simply a poor woman, but a poor woman of color, a descendant of slaves. There's no doubt that the color of her skin afforded her a different way of life, different access to medical care, and a different perspective on when and why she should go to the doctor. The color of her skin altered the way she moved through the world as an African-American woman in Baltimore in the 1950s. One cannot erase the real and lived consequences of racial discrimination, both then and now. Her cells were taken by a white male doctor and given to another white male doctor. They benefited from their, quote, discovery. While Henrietta was simply treated and discarded as all useless medical waste. Her family was not looked after. They struggled to get by. And after the loss of their wife and mother, HeLa cells remain the most commonly used in scientific research, available for scientists to develop and profit without any credit monetary or otherwise, given to the laxes. Some of Henrietta's children, Deborah and Zakaria, hadn't really had much time to know their mother. All they knew of her was what the public had told them about Gila. Deborah, in particular, was heartbroken for what happened to her mother's cells. She believed her mother was still in them, and perhaps she is. This podcast has focused a lot on the idea of supernatural activity, ghosts, paranormal experiences, and here we find the potential for that same type of energy, the remnants after the physical body dies. What happened to Henrietta? Is her soul at peace, buried next to her mother? Or is she alive in every one of her cells, being grown, tested on, and discarded? Gila remains an invaluable part of medical research. And it was not until 2010 that Johns Hopkins started the annual Henrietta Lacks Memorial Lecture to honor Henrietta and her impact on medicine and research. And in 2018, Hopkins named a building on the medical campus for her. Others pushed for acknowledgement of this woman sooner, such as Morehouse School of Medicine, who began the Gila Women's Health Conference in 1996, and the mayor of Atlanta, who declared October 11th, 1996, Henrietta Lacks Day. But most have no real knowledge of the woman who's allowed for so much to develop in medicine and health. People are trying to share her legacy. In 2011, Morgan State University in Baltimore granted Lacks a posthumous honorary doctorate in public service. And in 2014, Lacks was inducted to the Maryland Women's Hall of Fame. In 2017, a minor planet in the main asteroid belt was named 359426 Lax in her honor. Just last year, the New York Times published a belated obituary for her in their Overlooked History Project. There's also been an effort to include more of Henrietta's story in popular culture. The first articles published in 1976 in the Free Detroit Press and Rolling Stone brought Henrietta's story to the general public though it was not until the work of Rebecca Sklute that an extensive history was shared with the public, including two articles in 2000 and 2001 and her 2010 book, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. Sklute worked closely with the Lacks family, Deborah in particular, to bring both awareness to the woman whose cells remain the most important to medical research today, but also to bring more information to the family so that they could better know their mother and understand the true depth of her impact. Sklut's book was also developed into a film by Oprah Winfrey and was released in 2017. But my question is, will it ever be enough? For the woman who unknowingly provided medicine the necessary tools 
her own cells, to advance their knowledge, to save the lives of so many people, despite them having been unable to save her. It's nearly Thanksgiving, and this year, I'm thankful for Henrietta Lacks, and you all should be too. The medical research, treatments, and cures developed from the use of Henrietta's cells have spared us from polio, smallpox, developed vaccines for influenza, and provided treatments of diseases that either we or our loved ones have been spared of. We live our lives every day in a world absent of some viruses and infections, with technology and innovation afforded by Henrietta in ways that we may never be able to recognize. We may never understand the full effects of Henrietta's cellular contribution, and I doubt we can truly grasp what parts of her are still in those cells. Are they Gila, or are they Henrietta? There are very few photos of Henrietta, two that I've seen, one with her husband Day, and another, the most famous of her, with her hand on her hip. Those two photos capture a vivacious and loving woman, dedicated to her family, hardworking, and selfless. Her life was taken at a young age by the cancerous cells that have proliferated to provide medical treatments, cures, and developments that have saved lives for more years than Henrietta graced this earth. Today, her legacy is one that is synonymous with medical research, and I wonder what she would have thought about that. A simple woman, born in a shack, raised on a farm, educated until the sixth grade, a mother at 14, now the most famous cells in the world, leading scientific discovery and innovation. Is this who Henrietta wanted to be? Would she be proud of what her cells have done and the lives she saved? Or is a part of her still alive, living through more testing, more treatment, constantly being duplicated in her immortal life? Thanks for listening. We appreciate each of you and love hearing from you. So hit us up on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or email us at tales of the number two cities podcast at gmail.com. Please rate, review, and subscribe on the listening platform of your choice. We're on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Spotify. We're a bi-weekly podcast, but if you just can't wait for the next episode, head over to our Patreon and pledge for many episodes and bonus content. And never forget that we have merch. So head to Tee Public and check out some of our badass sales on merch. The holidays are coming. Again, we appreciate each of you. Thanks for listening. Until next time. <laughs>